This presentation is not about why you should prepare for an EMP attack. That should be obvious. This presentation is to increase your knowledge about EMPs and why so much on the internet is incorrect, such as the need for not grounding your Faraday cage. I do not wish to slam anyone. I just want to get the correct information out because everyone protecting their equipment needs to make the correct decisions based on accurate information. So, let's first cover some known history. Let's start with the solar storm of 1859. Thursday morning of September 1st, 1859, Richard Carrington, a 33-year-old amateur astronomer of England, first observed sunspot activity that would later lead to the monumental eruption. During his observation that morning, he suddenly witnessed two brilliant spots of light forming within the sunspot group, which rapidly grew in size, twice as bright as the sun itself. Within five minutes, the mega flare had peaked in size and intensity, reduced back to pinpoints of light, and then vanished. Early the following morning, much of the world was witness to a mass and tremendously bright display of the aurora, even at the latitudes in the tropics. During the same time, telegraph systems all over Europe and North America failed while spraying out sparks from telegraph poles and igniting widespread fires. Remember, the telegraph system was the only high technology of the day. Now let's jump forward a little over 100 years and look at Starfish Prime. It was a high-altitude nuclear test conducted by the United States on July 9, 1962. Starfish Prime caused an electric magnetic pulse, EMP, which was far larger than expected, so much larger that it drove much of the instrumentation off scale, causing great difficulty in getting accurate measurements. The Starfish Prime electromagnetic pulse also caused electrical damage in Hawaii, about 898 miles away from the detonation point. It knocked out street lights, set off burglar alarms, and damaged the telephone company's microwave link. Now, let's look at the geomagnetic storm of 1989. The solar storm tripped circuit breakers on the Hydro-Quebec power grid. This utility has some very long transmission lines and Quebec sits on a large rock, thus preventing the energy flowing through to the Earth. Some satellites in polar orbit also lost control for several hours. The Space Shuttle Discovery also had problems. Uh, one of the sensors in the tank supplying hydrogen to a fuel cell uh, was showing unusual high pressure readings. The problem went away after the solar storm subsided. Here we see a transformer failure from the storm. Uh, it was hot enough to melt large copper secondary windings. Some points to remember, this was internal damage and transformers of this size can take up to two years to be replaced. Let's take a quick in-depth look at what an EMP actually is. Let's look at a high altitude EMP such as what would be caused by a nuclear blast high above the earth. A nuclear burst will put out a fast pulse of gamma rays like x-rays but with a higher photon energies. This thin shell of photons will stream outward, including towards the Earth. Once low enough in altitude, the gammas start striking air molecules, knocking electrons off. The Earth's magnetic field will cause the electrons to turn, and this constitutes an electric current. This is what generates the EM signal. The altitude of the burst will determine how far reaching the effect will be. The GZ is directly below the burst, but the source region, the red, is what we call the smile region, or what we typically see on demonstrations, that arch that uh, has the largest effect. Then you have a tangent line, which also brings effect to those areas. When dealing with a high altitude EMP, we're dealing with the speed of light. Example, the E1, or early time, occurs in one millisecond. This gives us good indication that we must be prepared before an event happens. 
This shows an approximate spectral representation of various high-level EM environments, including lightning. A high-altitude EMP dominates the middle from about 1 megahertz to several hundred megahertz. Normal environmental noise and radio stations are shown below at the bottom of the chart. You'll notice the high-altitude EMP is the blue line. Knowing this, many people have used FM radios to test their Faraday cages. Fair enough, but do realize to test the effects in a VMP, we've had to multiply the FM signal by 73,500 times to reach the same amplitudes as an EMP. I don't know how many of you have that capability. Using an FM radio or similar device is just not a fair enough test for your Faraday cage. As most of you already know, dependent on the altitude of the blast, that will determine how far reaching the effects will be. Let's talk about the effects. In our society today, we are so interconnected through computer systems, power grids, uh, systems that depend on each other. Taking a look at this slide gives a fair representation of the ripple effect from disruptions. Our national power grid is very vulnerable to an EMP. They act as giant antennas for the energy to collect. In the continental United States, our power grid is broken up into three basic regions. And yes, Texas is kind of on its own there. Any disruption in a region can affect that whole area. One of our main vulnerabilities in the electrical grid is our transformers. The large transformers can take up to two years to be replaced. This is because they are not built in this country anymore and there's not a large stockpile of transformers. So if there's a large event, it will take quite a bit of time to restore power. EMPs can play havoc with our delicate electronic equipment, which we depend on so much. Here are some tests done with units that were not even turned on. You can see the results and the sparking caused by an EMP pulse. It takes a lot of money to test for EMP hardening capabilities. Here you see two air assets being tested. The airplane on the wooden structure is quite interesting that structure has no nails in it and is just glued together. Let's talk about a Faraday cage and their effects. We can thank Michael Faraday for his discovery back in the early 1800s. Many preppers used the Faraday discovery and utilized the information that he provided back in the early 1800s. Do remember, he would showcase this by using a dynamo and often just static electricity to create sparks. The low amperage uh, put on quite a show, so he didn't have to ground it, which helped increase the sparks on the outside of the cage. Today, we need to take a different approach. Today, we need to build a Faraday cage that can withstand an EMP. Some considerations need to be what type of material we're going to use and how thick we are going to make it. Depending on the material and thickness, the EMP will either bounce off your Faraday cage, be absorbed, in which case you better have a ground, or pass through. There are even some sites online that you can plug in the type of material you'll have and the thickness, and it will show you what kind of protection you will get. Let's look at some professionally made and military applications of Faraday cages. The military makes sure that the material they are using is thick enough and that all the seams are sealed. And because these structures are meant to be used on a regular basis, they have to be extra careful where they bring wires into the Faraday cage. Every coupling is grounded and has resistors in there to absorb some of that energy. So what is our bottom line? Well, you now know that an EMP could be 73,000 times stronger than an FM radio signal. So using an FM radio is really not that accurate a test for your Faraday cage. Also, the material you use and its thickness is important. Depending on that, 
your Faraday cage should be grounded so that energy can go somewhere and if you live on a rock you could get hit twice with the bouncing EMP signal also it's going to take years to bring back the electrical grid if we're hit by an EMP attack just remember a Faraday cage is of no value unless you have food water shelter a garden security and one last warning it's not just the large countries and rogue countries that can set off an EMP an EMP can be set off at the street level